Eileen, give me a second. Um, I need some time. Thanks. Yeah. Well, it's not bad. It's not bad. Let me give you a cup. You want some whisk ice with it? No, no, just straight. Okay. It's fine. Okay, fascinating topic. Just give me a minute. I'll get in. Wash my hands. Hey, Len, how are you? Uh, doing okay. Good. My, my condolences to you, your family. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. I can't see the label. What are you drinking? I don't know what it, it's. I, I think it's a concoction. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure. He said it's a blend. So I don't know if it's his blend or someone else's blend, but I'll let you know how it is. So just the two of us tonight. I I guess I um I saw Alan uh, wrote that he was not coming. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I assume Judy was not. Yeah, and I know. I, I think every other Thursday, like uh, the Lawrences and the Futtermans have a a program with uh, Rabbi Belsky. So. Uh -huh. So we had a fancy bottle of whiskey that someone's brought us, like one of the first weeks that we got here. Uh -huh. And I threw it out. You threw it out? I did. It's no good. It was a sherry cask. Oh, sherry cask. Okay. okay, so tonight we're going to try and study a little bit about sherry cask. Okay, I'll okay, I did. Let me take it a bit more. Well, <laughs> I'm going to be... Uh, Okay. Okay. It's, it's only it's only us, so you know. It's only, no, it's only us. I've got a bunch of guys coming in afterwards as well. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. So have you uh, have you ever read up about sherry gas? The history about sherry gas? A little bit, but not not for a long time. Then right. you familiar with the concept of sherry? um? You know, it's I it's come up when I've uh, it's come up with my son um when we've uh been in israel uh but i don't know i cannot remember what the uh okay the issue is so i, I know it's an issue but i don't know what the issue is so let's talk a little bit about so the history of sherry cask is very interesting i mean like technically i should just play this little video that i watched because i would give more concrete information than I have over here, but it, originally the, the history behind cherry cask, I'm going to see which, try and get, is the lighting okay with you? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. You look, okay the yeah, lighting is good. Okay. So originally the, the, the history was, so sherry, so sherry, sherry is 
this strong wine, which is a fascinating way, fascinating concept how they made this wine. It's like, um, I guess it's called like, it's a very high concentrate wine, right? And the way they make these wines is they have them age in these barrels. And the barrels are, are put, um, they're, they're stacked three high, okay? And their goal is that they want this, the wine to not be affected by the barrel at all. So the longer the wine sits in the barrel, the better it is. So they want it to never be affected. So they will use in share to make sherry. It's an it's a sherry is an area. In order to call wine sherry, it needs to be out of this triangle in Spain. And um, the way they make that wine is you have three barrels, one, two, three, and you'll only pull from the bottom barrel. You pull less, I think, up to one sixth of the barrel and pull out wine from that barrel. And then you'll fill it up from the second barrel. You'll fill it up. And then the second barrel you'll fill from the top. And then you pour your new sherry into the top, right? So it's constantly being trans, like concentrated, becoming more and more concentrated through this process. Okay, so what happened was, and then that sherry, it was very popular in Scotland, and they used to export the sherry from Spain to Scotland. The way they, so they would never use, they would never, when they transport the, the when they transport the sherry, they'd never transport the sherry in the original casks, right? They would never use those original barrels because they would keep those barrels to always be okay. the ideal for what they needed, right? They, they, they don't want to be that tab. So what they would do is they'd move the sherry into other barrels and those barrels were used to transport the wine. So they'd ship <clears throat> full barrels of sherry from Spain to Scotland. And then it was consumed in Scotland. In Scotland it got bottled, right? And then they didn't want to ship empty barrels back to Spain. So what they did was they'd fill them with, Scott, with whiskey and then they'd ship them back to Spain. So they'd fill these bottles, these barrels that were, that had originally had this sherry inside of them and they'd ship them down to, back to Spain. Then what happened was um, sherry did not became did not become so popular in Scotland, and um, so there was not such a huge import of sherry to Scotland. So there was a massive shortage of barrels to be used to transport the whiskey. Uh, another issue that came up was it was relatively recently um, was that Spain. Uh, they they decided that sherry had to be bottled in Spain itself. So you could not you could no longer uh, uh, move sherry out of out of Spain in in barrels. Okay. So with that we got the shortage of and so what they started to do was and and so at, at that point in time at that point in time there was no concept no one thought about utilizing the barrel to give flavor, give the sherry flavor to your whiskey. No one ever thought about it. It was a default. So what they, so they ran out of sherry casks, we call them sherry, and they ran out of sherry casks and they started shipping them in American oak. Okay. So they started shipping them in American oak and then people were saying it tastes different. And they were like, tastes different. So what's the deal? And it looks different as well. So sherry has got this red tinge to it. So they realized it must be the sherry. It must be, the it's the cask because the ingredients in order for whiskey to be considered whiskey, there are three ingredients that are allowed. Well, four ingredients, four ingredients, top technically. It's water, yeast, barley, and a barrel and oak. Those are the four ingredients that you're allowed in your whiskey, in your whiskey, right? <clears throat> so 
what influences every every uh, whiskey has got its unique taste, its unique flavor, its unique. Um, so it's how they mature, how they dry the barley, what kind of yeast they use, how they how they utilize the yeast, and then massive influence is the oak that they use. It depends where they get. You got European oak, you got American oak, you got different types of oak, and then the, also when they create the barrel. Um, so it's a fascinating thing. The way they create the barrel, um, they'll, they'll start the barrel at the top and they'll secure the top of the barrel because that's the easiest. And then the bottom of the barrel has all these pieces of wood that are loose, right? And then when they're loose, so they soak them in water, they'll soak them so that they don't become fire, so they become fire resistant. And then they'll put them over fire. And they're called, and it's called char. And they'll char these, this wood and the heat softens the wood to such a degree that they're able to bend them in in order to, to solidify and close in that bottom, right? In, um, I believe it was in, uh, bourbon has to be, has to be, uh, has to be charred. Has to, you can't, if it's not, it doesn't, hasn't been burnt inside, so then it doesn't, you're not allowed to, it's, it's not, burnt and then it, you can't call it bourbon it has to be has to be has to be used in a, it has to use a barrel that has been charred and then how do they do what they do with the peat i know when they so the peat, peat is very interesting so the peaty is actually i believe it's from the grain it's from the grain when they dry the grain mm -hmm. it's how they dry it so that you can use gas to dry and dry it or I think they they have they put it on the floor, they put it over a wood floor, and that heat, they send heat over that wood floor. And because it's a wood floor, the grain absorbs the wood. So they put the barley over over the wood, and then they I think they either they smoke that wood or send heat through it, and then it absorbs. So the barley absorbs the wood in an immense way, and then when they go and use that barley to make whiskey, it gives out the massive peat. Okay. okay, so um, so now what they actually do is so now what they what they do is so now um, so the casks that they use in Scotland for and have sherry casks. I mean, they so so originally they would move. So think about it. First of all. These casks that were originally being transporting the, they were originally transporting the, the whisk, the, sorry, the sherry. The sherry. They were in there for a short period of time. Where do you go? Where? What? Oh, sorry. So originally, think about it. They would only. Hi, Michael. So originally they transport the sherry in the cask only for a short period of time. It was only to get it from the factory. I don't know how long that took, right? But from the factory to the port, send it onto the boat to wherever it was. We're not talking about years of transport of the, of the wine sitting in these barrels. It would, probably weeks or months that, it, that it's, a, but the heat obviously and, and, and the liquid enabled it to get absorbed into the walls of the barrel, the sherry to get absorbed into the walls of the barrel. Um, okay, so, so, so now, so, so they were kind of stuck with the, with the problem and they started adding sherry, they started, they, right, since the, the advantage of using sherry is that it's a very, very concentrated, wine it's a very high high so usually wine is uh, five to ten percent alcohol content um sherry is 20 percent or higher it's like a strong point so um so what they started to do was they would they needed to take they had these plain barrels with oak and they needed to infuse it with the taste of sherry so the way they did it Hi, Liz. 
we start on time. So they needed to infuse barrels with with the taste of the wine. So what they actually did was they they would use um, they'd use uh, they put um, uh, a little bit of sherry and then they'd they'd use steam or they'd steam. I'm not sure if they steam sherry through it, through it, but they used pressure in order to enable the wall of the cask to absorb the sherry. Um, so when so so it's interesting. So originally we had they they had you know they they were, they were taking barrels from they were, they were moving moving uh, sherry wine from Spain to Scotland in these barrels and they were getting rid of the barrels. So the people who were making the whiskey were getting cheap barrels, right? They're getting cheap and they were using the barrels mm -hmm. because they were the cheapest barrel that they could get in order to transport the whiskey. And then ultimately became an exclusive thing of like, we need, we need this, the barrel that's got the sherry taste in it, right? So it, went, it was like an accidental discovery. And the truth is, if you think about it, the, the creation of, the, of whiskey has, is so core, it's so basic, it's, it's those four ingredients. So any way you're able to influence it. So, you know, the different sources of water in, in Scotland are going to influence their Remember, is it Kurs that have it that like in Colorado? Oh, yeah, like yeah. At the Colorado River, the place, like from yeah, there, yeah. from the source, right? And then they make it elsewhere now. But it, it's the water that has the inf that influences the, the taste and, and where you get your barley from. Um, and primarily, it's the oak that they use that is going to create that influence the taste of the whiskey. So, um, Okay, so that that's that's so so now it's very interesting how they make make them now. So now no one's really interested. No one's really drinking sherry. Not a lot of people. Anyone bought a bottle of sherry in the past no. decade? No cooking sherry. Cooking sherry. Yeah. It's the best, right? Yeah. It's as yeah. far as we go, right? No one's touching the sherry. It's just I think it's disgusting, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's worse than the man of shadows. So, I mean, <laughs> um, they, so no one's buying sherry, but everyone's buying whiskey. So, um, so then there's a huge popularity for their sherry cask. And how they're going to do that? So nowadays, the in Spain they became specialists of making casks. So you'll make they'll make the cask to your order um, with the specific oak that you want, and then um, and then they will put in they will soak the cask with sherry per your order, right? So if a whiskey maker wants a specific type of sherry, they'll get that one and then they'll, they'll order it specific and then they ship the barrels over empty. Is there a kosher sherry? Is there a kosher sherry? Yeah, there's like maybe one. I think, I think Kedem have one line of kosher sherry. I, I think I've come across it sometime back in uh, my Kashra's days that like someone needed sherry in, uh, in, in one of the ingredients and, and we had to go and find that. There was like that one, <laughs> one bottle imported from Italy, you know, that make one batch and that's it, you know, like, <laughs> um, okay. Okay, so let's, let's go through the halakha, halakhic issues of, 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 of that, that come up with regards to sherry, with sherry cask or... Um, four and five. Okay, with regards to kashras, we're gonna do a basic overview of very interesting concepts that come up with in kashras, uh, uh, that come up a lot in kashras, but specifically are also very relevant to wine. So the, uh, at the time of the Gemara, Arabis instituted a prohibition, or well, I think it's, made, it's even in the time of the Mishnah, the, the, our sages instituted a prohibition of drink, well, first of all, um, yain nesach. Yain nesach is trap, is not kosher, which means wine that was um, used for the service of idol worship. Yain, uh, wine that is used for the service of idol worship became non-kosher, was, was, was non-kosher. And then 
um, and then there became a new institution of wine that was made by a non-Jew became, was our sages instituted that they became non-kosher for two reasons. Number one, it may, when the non-Jew touches it, he may have intention of using this wine for idol worship. So I'm going to, what's the word when they pour it? Uh, when, you, when you pour wine for, uh, for a service, a spiritual service. What's the word? Wine, what makes the culture? Libates. Is that what you said, Adrian? To live, we're talking about libation. libation. Um, so, so the libating of, so, so libate or libation. So that forms, falls under the category of idol worship, which is prohibition. There is not only, it's not only prohibited to serve idols, but there's also the, the issues of benefiting from the service of idol, idol worship that is prohibited. So, um, so, so yeah, it's called yain nesach, wine that was libated. So they would take wine, they pour it over, or they pour it in front or over um, the idol, and then they gather the wine, it's good quality wine, and then they'd sell it, right? So that's called yain nesach, that was wine that was served for an idol worship, that's, that's that became non -kosher. Then our sages instituted that wine that is touched by a non-Jew, created, made by a non-Jew, that also became non-kosher because of, not only because the, the non-Jew may intend to use it for uh, libation, but also mishum uh, chitur, because we want to, the Arabs established a, a boundary so that we don't get too comfortable with regards to our relationships with non-Jews in order to stop assimilation to, a, to in an attempt to alleviate the problem of assimilation. That's called stam yeno. Okay, so sherry cask would fall under the, sorry, sherry, which is made by a non-Jew, would be considered non-kosher wine. Non-kosher wine is called stam yeno, wine that's made by a non-Jew, and therefore it's not kosher, we're not allowed to drink. That's number one. Number two, we have something called bilius or balua. And balua means it's absorbed. Okay. So for example, you have your favorite coffee mug, wherever it is. And if you look at your coffee mug, no matter how many times you wash it, right, it's gonna have its it's gonna have that stain at the bottom. And that stain, whether it be porous or metal, I got in this is my metal cup and it's stained, right? It is the, there's, there's a power of absorption, meaning things are getting absorbed into the walls of, the, of your, your clear, of your vessel, okay? Now, I say just say, when something gets, uh, how does it get absorbed? It's a concentration and heat, okay? So, so you, if you have hot, hot coffee, you'll, your hot coffee will absorb into your mug much sooner than cold coffee, right? It's just the heat enables, uh, what the heat actually does is it makes the clea, it makes the vessel more porous to be able, it, it opens up the pores of the vessel in order for it to absorb it, okay? And that's also one of the, one of the goals that when they heat the barrels, it makes, it makes the barrel more porous to absorb the sherry. So that's bilious. So with regards to if one has, um, and, and this is a regular issue of kashras, kosher, um, if, right, I go to a not, I, I go in, in Portland, it's so much more common. Like how dare you ask for a coffee in a disposable cup, right? They, so in, you go to a coffee shop in Portland, right? They got, the default is to serve, serve you coffee in a, in a, in a regular mug, right? Awesome. Say again. Adrian? Okay, so, so they, um, where was I going with that? So, so, so if, so I, I, let's say I go to a coffee shop in, in Portland, they give me coffee in a, in a, uh, in a mug, 
I would not drink, you can't drink it because most likely there was non-kosher milk or something added into, I don't know if most likely. I'm not gonna take my chances with regards to um, a mug that has bliss because when they put in fresh coffee into my cup, when they put hot coffee into my cup, it will absorb, uh, sorry, the, the pores of the vessel will open up and release some of the taste of that which is outside that was absorbed into it. So therefore, if one goes over to someone else that's- uh, but, but is glass, that, I thought glass was- No, glass according to the Shulchan Aruch, according to the Shulchan Aruch, they hold the glass is fine. Okay, so therefore, by default, when I go to manage your circumcisions and they offer me water, it will be in a glass cup. Glass cup or disposable, no one has disposable, except for from Jews nowadays. It seems like <laughs> only, no, one, no one really thinks that, like, <laughs> they all offer me there they open up their drawers and they've got hundreds of these you know like yeah, the yeah, water yeah. bottles of the, co the coffee mug that they received that every i'm like no thanks okay so that is bliss that something is porous that it's able to absorb so therefore let's pull it back into our sherry cask when we're pulling out when we have when they, we have a cask that has got sherry that sorry that held sherry in it so this, um, the cask absorbed the, the wine, okay? And then we take it out, we put in whiskey, and then what's happening is the whiskey will absorb the, the wine, right? Now, you may ask something, we spoke only with regards to heat. It's only when it's, when it's hot that it becomes a halachic shala that the, the vessel releases and absorbs only with, with regards to heat. So the answer is we have them, something called kavosh. Kavosh means when something settles for an, a, a long period of time, meaning if something sits for 24, uh, 72 hours, three days, if something sits in something for, for 72 hours, then it completely gets absorbed, even though there's no, no addition of heat. And the only way to get it out of that, let's say we're using metal, is we have to boil, and the boil gets releases that non-kosher taste. Okay, it's called the tam, the taste. Um, okay, then we have something called uh, tam ki'ikar or batal de shish. Tam ki'ikar, tam, which is a taste, which is the main part, or something that is batel, nullified with one sixtieth, okay? Which means that our sages said that if you have a pot of chicken soup and you drop in bread, bread, sorry, um, so if you have a hot, pot of chicken soup and one drops in less than one sixtieth of milk into your chicken soup, that does not become trade. Okay? Does not become trade. Because as I say, just say the one sixtieth is completely nullified by the taste of the chicken soup. Right? So it's completely kosher. Yeah? Question? No. One sixtieth. It's bottle decision. With regards to, so a number of times, it's happened in our house by accident, we, um, our, our cleaning lady put in a milk, a milk dish into our dishwasher, and it's a flagship dishwasher. And now we know that there was actually milk in our dishwasher and there's hot water spinning around and it's more than, it's more than 160. Do you need to worry about it? Okay, so here we come to the, to the last concept with, that we're going to uh, we'll deal with, which is relevant to us, which is called pago, which is a negative taste. Meaning when you got something that has been sitting, you got milk that's been sitting out in your counter for a couple of days or heat, whatever it is, or you put soap inside your dishwasher, 
then anything that's being mixed around is getting a negative taste, right? So even if I have, if I have off milk and I pour off milk into chicken soup, even if it's more than 160, that is not going to influence it for the good. The only time where the prohibition exists is when it's going to be influenced for the good. If it's influenced for the bad, if it's part of the case bad, then it's not it's okay. It's okay. And I say just therefore say, if a person with regards to wine, um, with regards to wine, if you have water, uh, sorry, if you have a barrel and there is non kosher wine at the bottom, even more than 1 60th, more than 1 60th of wine at the bottom of the barrel, and you add up water, okay, is that water kosher or not kosher? Depends how good the wine is. You got more than one sixtieth of wine yeah. inside your barrel, but you got most of it is water. Let's say forty parts is water, thirty parts is water. What do you say? Is 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 the water kosher or not kosher? So the answer is that the water is kosher. Reason is because, and this is actually from the Gemara. The Gemara actually says what's happening is your water. You want water, right? you have a negative influence of wine, of grape flavor, what we call grape flavor. It's such a small percentage, not such a small percentage, but that's not the intention. You want clean water. We don't want the grape inside there. We don't want the grape inside. So therefore, with regards to wine, we are more lenient with how much wine needs to be present in order for the liquid to be made non-kosher. And Ramosha holds, Ramosha Feinstein holds that one sixth, you need one sixth of wine in order to influence something to be not kosher. So it's much higher a percentage. You need, you, you have much more in order to be able to make something non kosher, in order to allow wine to influence more from a non kosher perspective. Okay, so what actually happened, the, the case over here is. Um, blended yine sherry. This was a letter that he received in Tafshan Chet, which is 508. Um, how many years ago is that? Many years? 60, 70 years, years ago? ago? Yeah. So there was a rabbi, his name was Rabbi Tights, Pinchas Tights of Elizabeth. I guess Elizabeth, New Jersey. I don't know. And um, they were making bourbon, and in order to make the, the bourbon, what they were doing was, in order to give that, they were actually adding up to, they're adding sherry directly into the bourbon. Two, they were adding up to 2%, 2.5% sherry into the bourbon itself. And that's where the whole Shaila came in. So it wasn't even, they weren't using cask, they were just adding mm -hmm. pure bourbon, pure sherry into the cask to give it that sherry, the sherry flavor. And Ramosha Feinstein goes on a whole question, a whole discussion about whether it is a problem or not from a halachic perspective. Um, so, so he goes in and he talks, he talks about wine and being one sixth, that you only need one sixth. You need one sixth of uh, of the of non-kosher wine to influence something to be not kosher. Okay, so um, so if you've got two point five percent sherry added to your whiskey, it shouldn't make a difference. It shouldn't make a difference, right? So now the question is, and, and he goes through and he talks about why wine is very kosher. The wine is is important. It need it's got so therefore we, when our sages instituted the prohibition of wine, Mishum uh, because they daughters, we don't want, want to have a, have a social distance because of, of intermarriage. They put it down at this point with regards to, it needs to be a high quality thing. No, our sages are not prohibiting us drinking orange juice together with the non-Jew. There's no, there's not that problem. It's, it's a high quality thing that 
that we're talking about. In fact, wine is actually used to be at the time of the Gemara, the wine used to be much, much more concentrated. If you remember, at, on Pesach time, we have someone else what? When you fill up your coast, or someone else pours it. Someone else pours it for you. Now the Gemara actually says, let's say it pours it for you, it di dilutes it for you. At yeah, the time of the Gemara, they'd fill up, they'd give half the cup and then they dilute it with water because it's so concentrated. So, um, so at the time of the Gemara, the wine that was prohibited was a much more concentrated wine. So now with regards to something that is so much more diluted, does that prohibition happen or not? Um, <clears throat> So Ramosha finds the inhale that the prohibition of stamina of wine that is not a Jew, that is made by a Jew, is not referring to wine that is that is a grape flavored water, right? So even if you've got a much greater percentage of wine, we're not talking about wine, we're talking about a, a a flavoring, and that's not where the prohibition is, especially if you're talking about a prohibition of intermingling of a social issue. Social issue is going to be an issue where you're talking about high quality wine. Um, so Ramosha held that one sixth is good. So now what the challenge is going to be is how, how much, it, it's, it's one thing when you have 2.5% sherry added to your bottle, added to your wine. But 2.5% sherry, not a problem. It's not a problem at all. The question is, if you've got a sherry cask, what percentage of the cask is, has sherry absorbed in it versus the volume of the whiskey? So apparently, you're, in order to make whiskey, there's a limit to 700 liters. How much is 700 liters? Hey Siri, how many what are gallons, you gallons is 700 liters? 700 liters 185. is 185 gallons. So, so it's very interesting. It was done by you know a whole bunch of halachic heads who were getting together with regards to how much of the cask is, has been absorbed by the sherry. So if we say that, so, so the, the numbers, they, they move, they fluctuate between 135 liters versus 135 liters for a 500 liter gallon, 500 liter yeah. barrel, okay? That makes it up of to be 26%. So now 26%, is that more or less than? Uh, it's more than one sixth. It's more than one sixth. Right, so that would be a problem. So the question, like the whole discussion, one of the major parts of the discussion became, was is the, is the sherry completely absorbed by the entire wall of the barrel or not? That's really where, where it is. Especially today, in those days where they had it to a certain degree of uh, where the wine sat in the barrel for an extended period of time, months or whatever it is. I mean, I, I guess so. so that you could say that that had a, a more of an absorption. Nowadays, where they're using a certain amount of sherry and they're using uh, pressure or steam in order to get the wool to absorb the sherry, it's possibly, one can possibly say that there is less of an influence of, of sherry absorbed into the wool altogether or not. Now the truth is now I'm thinking about it. One could actually, since they're they're made to order, one can actually probably. I, I saw a whole interview with, you know, the Spanish guy who's got a factory of how he makes how they make the barrels, and it, it, it's, it's a really cool cool production. But I mean, I could probably go and see exactly how much how much sherry is being added to the barrel, and then how much they're taking off, taking out at the end of the day. And you can measure exactly how much sherry is in the, is is absorbed into an average sherry cask. Does that make sense? Right? I mean, like yeah. it's measurable. So um, currently, I mean, the one the one volume, and, and, and this is like also fascinating with regards to the halachic issue of how much volume 
and what's what's really fascinating is like Rashi, I, I don't remember where, but Rashi gives you a, um, you know, you just plug in the numbers mm -hmm. and he gives you an equation of exactly working out how much the thickness of, or the, the circumference of any object is versus the volume. Hmm. Yeah, I remember it was just like fascinating. We're all like sitting, breaking our heads on, you know, none of us maybe went through university with regards to calculus or any. And, and like Rashi just like, he just throws the equation, just like, by the way, this is the equation, and that's how you do it. Um, you know, it's, it, like science was, was well, well understood yeah. uh, at, at the time of our, our sages. So, so with regards to getting back to our share. So our first, our first thing is, is this, is this enough of what we, our sages would call stamyena? Are we drinking stamyena? Are we, is this a problem where we're, we're, there's going to be an issue of intermingling with non-Jew from the perspective of drinking wine together? There's definitely not. So where does this fall under, under that category? Um, Someone else did a, a girl. A, yeah, someone in someone in Israel did a um, did an evaluation of the volume of the wall. Um, a girl, meaning someone in seminary in Israel, she, they were studying that the they were studying the properties, and then she went and did this whole mathematical equation to evaluate like how thick. It depends how thick the oak is to evaluate how how much of it is absorbed. Um, and then people say that they cut the oak in half, right? It's very, it's a, it's a popular thing to, when they don't use oak anymore, a, a barrel, they'll cut the barrel in half and use them as pot plants, right? So you can actually see in the oak how much of it has been absorbed. Um, so there, there is a whole discussion that many people are arguing that is the entire wall being absorbed, absorbing the sherry or not? If we say it's not even absorbing the, enti the entire wall, is not even absorbing all the sherry, and definitely not the entire wall is releasing the sherry, and definitely over a period of time, there's, there's much less of taste of sherry being influenced in, uh, into, into your whiskey. The big problem is, is Dabar Khashiv. Something called davar chashiv means something that's important. Davar chashiv, eino misbato. Something that is important, it does not get, lose its influence. Meaning it doesn't get uh, nullified because you, uh, it's, it's, it's overwhelmed by the numbers, right? So davar chashiv, if you're putting a specific ingredient in that gives a certain flavor, right? Putting in pork to give the pork flavor, even if you go more than one second, if you're trying to pull out a specific flavor, then that becomes a, that, that is prohibition. It's double khashu, it's something that's important, something, something that is defined, something is, it stands out by itself, that can, that, that doesn't, um, it doesn't lose its, its importance. So the question now is that, does is the sherry a double kasha? Is the sherry something that's important? What what um, what identity does the sherry take with regards to um, with regards to the whiskey? Is the sherry just to give it an influence, or is the sherry to give it a wine taste? And that's where there's a whole there's a whole argument between different rabbinical opinions with regard nowadays about. <clears throat> How much influence? What is it considered an important something that's important? Um, to say the least, I mean, when we were in Portland, the Rosh Kodal over there, he was Irish. He had Irish blood. His, his grandmother came from Ireland, and uh, any I would say any good quality Irish whiskey um, will will usually be aged in cherry cask. We'll, we'll have a sherry cask. So, so over here, so that's the end of my class. It, it is, it is, I mean, like, I don't know, Len's gonna say, more, more unclear than clear. 
<laughs> but at, at, at the end of the day, it, it's important to kind of like become more familiar, familiarize ourselves with with issues. What Moshe Feinstein actually ends off with his with his uh, tshuva, he says that from his perspective, it would seem that it is fine, but he calls it a bal nefesh, someone who's sensitive about his his spiritual self will will stay away from it. Okay, you say someone some who's who's self more more will will stay away from it. Um, I remember in in Eretz Yisrael we were in we were in Kailom, and one of the guys he received a three hundred dollar bottle of whiskey that was that had sherry cask on it. So you know if it was like a twenty five. 30 or even a hundred dollar bottle, you know, you wouldn't like, uh, you wouldn't think twice about it. He wouldn't have thought twice. It's a three hundred dollar bottle. I'm sure is is relatively good quality. So he didn't know what to do. So he went and asked Rabbi Berger. I remember like he walked in with him to our to Rabbi Berkowitz and uh, and and Rabbi Berkowitz said it's like he he didn't he didn't say it's trade or it's not kosher or he's like it's not appropriate to you you know you're growing rabbi rabbi students and you know you're trying to become more sensitive to your spiritual self and you're going to try and influence and like you know to cut corners or to be more le more lenient with some something like this it's like it's not not appropriate to you. um <clears throat> so there's this phenomenal book or PDF if anyone wants to read it. It's called Sherry Cast, a halachic perspective. I think we have the it's it's available on in, in PDF all over the place. I think the, he's he's a rabbi, I think his name is Rabbi Nihaus. And I think he lived over here. He lives over here in part of the Kodal. So he, um I just printed over here what he says about the identities of different whiskey. So many, many bottles of scotch list on the label, the type of cask used for maturation. If sherry casks are mentioned on the label, this generally indicates that there's a high percentage of sherry casks present. This will generally disallow nullification as will be explained. A, 100% sherry casks, and important to note that the problem of sherry casks generally applies only to scotch that is labeled as 100% sherry cask. This can be expressed in a number of ways. The label states it was matured in sherry cask, such as the Macallan 12 year old, which is exclusively matured in selected sherry oak casks from Jerez, Spain. Uh, Jerez, how do you want to pronounce it? Uh, number two, the scotch was finished in sherry cask or other wine casks, such as Glamorangi La Santa, which is initially matured in bourbon casks, then matured or finished in Olorosa sherry cask, right? So it's, they, it depends where you get that wood, that oak, that will influence the, the flavor. Three, was double matured, such as the Balvini double wood, 12 year old, which is matured in traditional whiskey oak casks, and a further few months maturation in European oak sherry casks. Such scotch, which is 100% sherry cask matured or finished is problematic because does not have a liquid to wood ratio of at least six to one. So he said like that, um, even if the label mentions sherry casks, even if the la label mentions sherry casks, some single malts may still be acceptable. Several varieties of single, single malt scotch found on the market consist of a mixture of bourbon cask and sherry cask. The Glenfiddich, 12 year old, this should not be confused with double matured scotch mentioned above, which refers to scotch that is matured first in bourbon casks and then in a sherry cask. And this scotch is more lenient because only the portion of scotch that originated in sherry casks require nullification. The portion, so they're mixing. So they take some of the scotch and, and mature it in sherry cask mm -hmm. and other that's, um, it's called a mixture of bourbon casks and sherry casks. That's what they, it's a single malt scotch, consists of a mixture of bourbon casks and sherry casks. So the Glenfiddich 12 year old, so they, they mix two. So he said, that's okay. not a problem because they're not taking all of the whiskey and putting it and maturing it in a sherry cask. They're taking some from the sherry cask. Um, this is going to be more lenient 
Uh, the portion that originated in bourbon cast does not require nullification. Generally, the volume of scotch which originated in non-wine barrels, in addition to the scotch itself, is enough to nullify the wine bleus bechage, one sixth. Based on various calculations, it appears that any scotch containing a mixture of sherry and bourbon cast may be assumed to have at least shesh against the non-kosher wine bleus, provided that the percentage of sherry cast is less than 66.5% listed below or a number of examples that fit this criterion. So he's basically saying is that you can have many, many whiskeys out there that call, that have sherry cask on the label, but it does not mean that they are exclusively sherry cask, but they're actually a mixture. In the example above, Glenn Fittich, 12 year old, the label, newly designed, stated that is matured in the finest Oloroso sherry and bourbon casks. So it says sherry and yeah. bourbon casks. Although the distiller does not disclose the cask breakdown, other sources reveal that it is 85% bourbon cask and 15% sherry cask. Since only 15% of the scotch originated in sherry cask, okay. the wine bleus are bottle bechage. Another example, the label of the Glenfiddich 18 year old, I remember I refused the Glenfiddich 18 year old because I remember it, so it, had, it has three, bar three barrels on it. Uh, it states that it is matured in the finest Oloroso sherry and bourbon cask and is then married for at least three months in oak, to, in oak tons, tunes. According to the official Glenfiddich blog, the 18 year old is a batting of 80% American oak matured whiskeys and 20% European wine barrels. A very classy whiskey that ensures we remain the most awarded single malt whiskey in the world. A very classy whiskey that ensures we remain the most awarded single malt whiskey in the world. Since only 20% of the scotch originating in sherry cast, the wine blades are surely nullified. With regard to Glenfiddich 15 year old, Level states that richly layered Glenfiddich 15 year old is matured in three types of, oh, this is the one that actually, three types of oak cask, sherry, bourbon, and new oak, before being married in our unique handcrafted Solera vat. According to a claim, uh, to a claimed whiskey writer, Dave Broom, the split is 70% bourbon, 20% sherry, and 10% new, uh, new cask. Because only 20% of the scotch was sherry cask matured, the wine bleus are bottle bechage, so they're nullified. An additional example is the McAllen Fine Oak 10 year old. The label states that it is triple cask matured in a unique complex combination of exceptional oak casks, European oak casks seasoned with sherry, American oak casks seasoned with sherry, American oak casks seasoned with bourbon. Although the company does not disclose the, ca the cask breakdown, at least one source reveals that 50% of the whiskey originated in bourbon casks. Uh, and then just Bourbon cast accordingly, the non kosher wine bleus may be assumed to be nullified. Bishesh. Um, the Delmori are a mixture of sherry and bourbon. Same thing. Emo sherry cast single malts currently on the market are a mixture of sherry cast and bourbon cast based on the above, these products are likely permissible. So what ultimately is saying, even if one is very uh, stringent with, with this regard, um, you only, the issue would be specifically um, these that are exclusively sherry cast, that are, that, that are what, what's the word? Scotch that is labeled as 100% sherry cast. This can be expressed in a number of ways exclusively matured, or scotch was finished in cherry cask, or is double matured, meaning double first in here, and then, then in there. Okay, oh. gentlemen. Can, can you do a quick thing on Mabushal? Mabushal, why that's Mabushal? And why, why if it's not? Why not is Mabushal? Then Mabushal, why, right. why can't I pour you a cup of wine if, if it's a non Mabushal? That's how I understand it. Right. So wine that's mabushal is wine that has been, has received a, it's been heated to a certain degree. And our stage has held that this high quality wine that we're talking about that is not kosher, that if it's made by a non-Jew, it's not kosher, is only in its high, higher state. Meaning the moment that the wine is cooked to a certain degree, it loses its status. 
it, uh, so the moment it loses, uh, the moment it gets cooked to a certain degree, it loses its status. So, um, so that's where Mubushal comes in. So Mubushal makes it non-influent, non-influence. It kind of like, hey guys, how's it doing? Just give me one more minute. One more minute. Okay. I'm finishing. Do you guys want to go through? Go to the back. Sure. Yeah. Yasi, take them. Yes, can you open up the back, the porch? Please, thank you. So the thank you. You're welcome. So the, the challenges became uh, with regards to they became a a fine with that I say just put. And the fine became the fine was that if someone is is not Shomu Shabbos, then they're going to retain receive that status of if you touch wine that is not kosher sorry wine that is not mabushal then it becomes it becomes not kosher it's fine that i say just put uh from that perspective doesn't it doesn't receive so kind of whatever happens over there it gets influenced over here as well okay okay thank you Thank you, guys. I don't know if Sunday night is happening. I need to push uh, Dr. Didi. I'll, I'll have an answer for tomorrow. I'm going to try and encourage her to be willing she wants a bit more. We, we didn't come up with the, with the topic soon enough. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Have a good job, Bye, Adrian.